you, Moran, for the nice introduction. So before I jump into my solutions for the phosphorylation problems, I thought I would just give a, I, I got it, I got it. <laughs> I would give a little bit of the core philosophy and the core view that we have in the Center for Chemical Evolution. So while the RNA world looks really good and probably existed at some time, we don't believe that that was the very first um, form of life that existed on this planet. We believe that there was something that preceded it, and we use clues from RNA and DNA to figure out what could have preceded that. And so one of the ways that we do that is we look at modern RNA and DNA and break it down into its three central components. You have the recognition units, the bases that it uses to store the information, and also what can do the base pairing and solution. You have the ionized linker, something that has some sort of charge on it. Modern life uses phosphate, and this helps it to solubilize in solution and also helps the base pairing to happen by repelling the negative charges. And then you have a trifunctional connector, a bridging molecule that keeps these pieces together and has nice chemical functionality to help chemistry and biochemistry down the line. So in our center, we work on changing out these pieces from RNA and, and DNA and putting other pieces in there and seeing how this affects its properties and if you can have life without having the specific backbone as we see in modern biochemistry. So we've had a good deal of success replacing the bases for the recognition units and replacing the trifunctional connectors, but we've run into some problems when we try to change that ionized linker into other moieties with our group and other groups in the world, it just doesn't work as well. So as opposed to trying to change it, where some of us in the lab are trying to embrace it, what if we had phosphate at the origins and it got incorporated into the molecules? But this is fraught with some problems that have haunted um, the astrobiology community for the past 50 to 60 years. So one of the first issues is how do you even react it with early molecules? How do you get phosphate incorporated in? So. These reactions are not favored in water at all. It drives off water. It's very hard to do in a water-based reaction. And so modern biochemists use organic solvents and dry conditions to actually add the phosphorylation, which is problematic because you can view the early Earth just covered in water. And so it's nice to find some water or liquid-based chemistry to make this happen. And another major problem is the phosphate availability issue. So a lot of the phosphate that we see on modern Earth and we see from the mineral records is bound in insoluble species with the divalent cations. And so this has traditionally been considered to be extremely inaccessible for prebiotic chemistry. So how do we knock out these problems one at a time? So how did the phosphorylation chemistry even happen? So a remarkable molecule that's been studied for the past 40 years is urea. This is actually the first organically synthesized molecule from uh, Wohler in the early 19th century. And it's a very, it is thought to be extremely abundant on a prebiotic earth. And one of the things that we always like to describe is you have the salt flats that you can see throughout the world now, like this one depicted in Utah. Well, on a prebiotic earth, urea would have been so abundant that we probably would have had urea flats just like we have salt flats. So this would be very abundant and found everywhere. And when you take a very simple reaction, you mix in some soluble phosphate with urea, and different sugars, you have no water, and just add heat 100 degrees or more, you actually form the phosphorylated product. So this has been discovered about 40 years ago, and it's a very nice reaction and a good way to get phosphate attached. But it requires high temperatures that degrade a lot of the molecules 
that you want to phosphorylate and creates an awful lot of side products. It's a very messy reaction with low yield, but it does work. So we have some chemistry that can work. Well, how do you solve the problem of running it in the presence of water? So as I pointed out, you can see the reaction at the bottom, just attaching phosphate to a simple molecule like glycerol, it drives off water and you form the, phosphor, the, the phosphorylated organic down there. It doesn't work if there's water because you need to remove the water. So one of the things that we've started to look at based upon some previous work is using eutectics. And eutectics are very unique systems. You can take two solids, like is depicted on the left and the right there, mix them together, and they actually form a liquid. So it lowers the melting point of both of them, and you can take it to very low temperatures in a water-free environment. And so the eutectics that I use for my experiments, they do start with excess water, but we heat them, open to the atmosphere, and drive off most of the excess water and create this nice liquid environment that goes down to very low temperatures. So now we have this, um, now we have this eutectic, which I use urea to make. So it's a very urea-rich environment that's liquid, and you can do a lot of very interesting fluid-based chemistry at low temperatures. And the eutectics that I use are made of very viable components prebiotically. So I have like ammonium formate, and ammonium acetate. We look at different chemical synthetic reactions that would have been likely on a prebiotic earth and see a lot of these just pop out. And one of the wonderful things is if you mix these together, it evaporates off most of the compounds and you get a very specific ratio in a perfect ratio for doing a lot of the chemistry that we're looking for. So you can start with any concentration that you want and it all converges upon what we need. So we've found a reaction medium that removes the water from it. So that's cool, we have two steps down already. But where do we get the phosphate from? And this has traditionally been the biggest problem with prebiotic phosphorylation. So most of the minerals would be present in, or most of the phosphate would be bound in hydroxyl apatite, which is extremely insoluble. So it's bad for doing chemistry, but it's good for modern life as this is what we make up, what we use to make up bones. And if bones were soluble, that would be a big issue. So uh, that's a problem. These don't dissolve. You don't have any phosphate in your solution. So we start looking at the modern earth as an analog and try to figure out where we could have got phosphate from and see if it would be similar to what we could have on a prebiotic earth. So one of the environments depicted at the top is Laguna Santa Maria in Argentina. And we see that this is a phosphate rich system that is in this aqueous pool, so that seems great. But when you take a closer look and you see that the phosphate is coming from all of the biomass that's in there. So it's not really a mineral source, it's just a biological source. But then one of my collaborators remembered some of his work that he did in Spain, just looking at, um, of all things, pig urine and waste ponds. <laughs> so these are urea, magnesium, and calcium-rich environments that just form giant waste pools. And when you look at them, you would expect to see the calcium phosphate, the hydroxyl apatite that I've depicted before, but instead you see this mineral called struvite, which is a much more soluble form. And you see that to the exclusion of any other minerals in there. So instead of forming a hydroxyl apatite, it gets trapped in this more soluble form. So we started thinking, can you do this in a laboratory? So we tried to synthesize this struvite, which would be a much better source for phosphorylation. And we thought about this in terms of a prebiotic model. So you can have a pool on the early earth full of calcium, magnesium, and phosphate. It would precipitate and form this mineral at the bottom. Then you could drive off all the water. You have some local outgassing from volcanoes and other hydrothermal vents, and it could form it could provide magnesium and sulfate and urea and formate. The rain could come down, wash it into the pool, 
And then you get the conversion to the exact form of minerals that we need down there. So instead of calcium phosphate, now you have a struvite <laughs> layer at the bottom. And you've done it. You've mobilized the phosphate. So we tested this in the laboratory. We simply took the hydroxyl apatite, mixed it with the eutectic, heated it for seven days with adding in magnesium sulfate, and lo and behold, we saw the conversion of hydroxyl apatite to struvite. And we have um, the XRD and the Raman spectra over there to help to prove it, but we saw basically quantitative conversion in these conditions, which is fantastic. So we wanted to put it all together and see if not only you could convert, but if you could also phosphorylate. So one of the things we look at for prebiotic chemistry is you want to keep it simple. The early earth didn't have a lot of tools, and neither should we. So I just run my reactions on a simple plate by mixing everything together. So I take adenosine as my model molecule, mix it with any phosphate source, mineral or soluble phosphate, heat it from 50 to 85 degrees, and I do get phosphorylated adenosine. And one of the nice things, I put up this chromatogram up here just to show how clean these reactions are. So every peak on there represents a different species. And so I get all of these phosphorylated species and not many other side reactions. So this is a lot cleaner than the previous work. And overall, I've created four different eutectics that I show up here. The part that's outlined in red is using soluble phosphate. And you can see I can get upwards of 90% phosphorylation when, phosphate, uh, when the phosphate is in water or in the eutectic soluble. When I take the struvite, or nuberiite, as I have depicted here, which is moderately soluble, the phosphorylation does go down, but I can still get better than 20%. So that is a pretty good mineral for phosphorylating. You can't expect 100% yields from everything. But one of the most remarkable things is with the hydroxyapatite down there, we get a small amount of phosphorylation, which is better than what is shown here with just the urea, where you get none. And even more interestingly, when we add magnesium to the reaction, magnesium sulfate, we see a doubling or tripling of the amount of phosphate. So we take these eutectics, just add some magnesium sulfate, and we get a good amount of phosphorylation, helping to address a long-held problem in prebiotic chemistry. So the overall conclusions, the phosphorylation is robust. It happens in a wide range of mixtures, not a very specialized reaction. It's observed at moderately low temperatures, as low as 50 degrees, which is very easy on a prebiotic earth. It's successful with the insoluble hydroxyl appetite, and it's significantly improved in the presence of magnesium sulfate. These are very prebiotically viable conditions. And so I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators from many different institutes, from the University of Southern Florida and from the Universidad de Alcala, and my group and my funding sources. And I'd like to take any questions now. Questions. You ready? All right, catch. <laughs> It's worked. All right. Uh, is the is the mechanism there more tied to the heating or to the drying? Of the, the mechanism of the is tied to the urea in the absence of water. Okay. So you do need some heat there in order to actually activate the phosphate. Okay. So it's not about driving the it's not about driving the water off. It's about um, it's about both. It's about, okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> if I try to run it in water, if I close the vials, it doesn't work right. at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gathered that. Uh, what about the pH? For example, you have hydroxyapatite, which is not soluble, but if you add sulfuric acid, which is common in volcanic settings, you just leach all the phosphate immediately. So it's not a problem on the more acidic pH in seven. 
Sure. Yeah. And so that's one of the things you can have extremely low pHs, which will solubilize it. And that's fine. But it's hard to preserve a lot of the chemicals that you need and do other reactions in an extremely acidic environment. So you can view it as a multi-step problem where you dissolve it, you possibly phosphorylate it, and then you move it on to another system. So that's been the traditional view of it before, but it's highly contentious because of the other problems with the chemistry. And so this is a nice one pot, one step system. It's a nice system. Thank you. We have no, no more time. Let's thank you.